Welcome to this policy exchange friend event, event about uh, federal Britain. I'm Rebecca Lowe, I'm State and Society Fellow and uh, Convener of Political Thought Research Group at Policy Exchange. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd also like to thank our excellent panellists whom, whom I'll introduce in a moment. But first, let's just have a quick think about what it is that we tasked them to think about this morning. Over the past few decades, we've seen increasingly popular demand for various forms of devolution, whether in terms of the establishment of national assemblies or the embrace of powerful elected mayors. Questions continue to arise, however, about Britain's unusually centralised political power base and the financial and representational imbalances in our system. An answer sometimes posed is federalism, an answer which has gained a new potency following the Brexit vote. Today, we'd like to consider what are the strengths of this suggestion in terms of application and appetite. Does Brexit make the union more or less secure? What should the UK government control? What would federalism mean for our political structure and institutions? Does the concentration of economic activity prevent a realistic devolution of revenue-raising powers and fiscal responsibility? In 2004, my home region of the North East voted decisively against a regional assembly. Have times changed? And finally, maybe, what does the Uberman, Uber ban mean for the popularity of the London mayoralty, both in terms of its current instantiation and perhaps the concept as a whole? So this morning we are delighted to have with us Paul Sweeney, Labour and Co-op Member of Parliament for Glasgow North East since early this year, and Shadow Minister for Scotland. We also have Lindsay Certain, Professor of Public Law in the University of Sussex since 2015, previously of the Universities of Sheffield, Manchester, University of East Anglia, LSE, and the University of the West Indies. We're going to give them each about five minutes to talk, and then we're going to open it up to some questions. So thanks very much. Paul, would you like to start? Yeah, OK. Um, well, thanks for everyone for a, a very early start. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling slightly delicate. Um, but, but what a way to start the day on a question of the future of the UK. Um, never a more pressing point, particularly for any MP from Scotland, particularly Labour, one who's managed to make a breakthrough with a 242 majority overturning a 39% swing uh, in the last election. I think no one in Scotland from the Labour Party has any um, misconceptions about how critical the constitutional debate has been in the last few years. Um, we paid a blood price for that in quite a severe way in 2015 with the virtual wipeout of the Labour Party in Scotland and its elected representatives in Westminster. Um, luckily managing to now recover from that. Um, but nonetheless, it's still a issue that's not really been dealt with in any great comprehensive way and it's still something that the rest of the UK, I think it's fair to say, has struggled to really position at the heart of political discourse in any convincing manner. I was reflecting on the anniversary of the referendum, um, which was just last week uh, in 2014, and that morning, after a, a heavy night at the Marriott Hotel in Glasgow, watching the results coming in, and then seeing David Cameron come out of Downing Street and announce that he had enough of listening to the Scotland de uh, debate, they've had their say, and now it's a question about England and English votes for English laws. And I thought in that moment he imperiled the United Kingdom in a way I never thought a Prime Minister would act. In such a reckless move, and it, with complete ignorance of the, the, the gravity of the situation that now faced the UK, and singularly failed to rise to the occasion of what that debate required. Um, and then opened up an entire Pandora's box, which the Nationalists then took advantage of in the subsequent general election. So I, that was a dismaying moment for me, and um, I don't feel that we have sub ever since that point grasped the, the, the enormity of the situation in the UK. And I was also thinking back about um, what John Smith was saying in the early 1990s um, when he was talking about the devolution question in the, the early days and during John Major's government. And his point was that there were two forces sawing away at the legs that support the UK. One is obviously the nationalist movement in Scotland and in Wales, which quite extensive, you know, quite clearly want to destroy the United Kingdom, that's their singular objective, but also the stupid Conservative Party, which through their complete inflexibility, their dogmatic approach to unionism for the sake of unionism, fail to understand the forces at play in the United Kingdom and risk fracturing it by their ignorance and their tone deafness to the need to reform the UK. Um, and I feel we still, those, those words still ring true today. Um, and I, no, none more so than that moment when David Cameron went out of Downing Street in the morning of September the 19th, 
um, 2014. And that then leaves the challenge to the Labour Party. The Labour Party is, in my opinion, the only force that will hold the United Kingdom together in the future. And that's why the SNP are so obsessed with destroying the Labour Party in Scotland, because it is the only force between uh, their objective, the breakup of the United Kingdom. Um, and that's where we need to understand why we need to rise to the occasion. Um, it is incumbent upon the Labour Party at a national level to grasp the situation and embrace a federal model. Um, whilst we pursued devolution in Scotland, we haven't really looked at the other side of the equation, which is what is the question of England? How does that, how does that form of devolution or that form of federalism or balanced approach to devolution take? Um, we've discussed the idea of regional mayoralties, which have taken root in Liverpool and Manchester. Um, so, how do we do it more coherently? 2004, North East Assembly was voted again, voted against in plebiscite. Is that really? Was it really sold in a way? You know, it's almost like the, the North, the, the EV referendum. It was never really coherently <laughs> sold very well. It was never really convincingly presented as a coherent package of reform. And no one, and by the same token, no one voted for the current model we have, which is a, a fairly incoherent mess, actually. Um, and we always also seem to take some sort of perverse pride in the fact that the country doesn't have an un, has, doesn't have a written constitution, which I think is absurd, uh, frankly. Um, and the more we look at these questions, I think we need to get a grip at a, a UK level. I've been quite impatient about the Labour Party's progress with regards to the Constitutional Convention that we proposed. I feel that that's something that the Scottish Labour contingent will be pressing much more robustly to move it forward. Um, I know that the IPPR and others have done a lot of work on what form a Constitutional Convention can take. It's, you know, in its most um, elaborate form, it's something that might cost up to £10 million pounds to run. So it's not necessarily a, a, a sort of a trivial exercise. It will be a fairly ambitious exercise, particularly for a party in a position of opposition to undertake. But I feel that it's absolutely critical that we have a, a fully fledged position for when we do enter government, the people of the UK understand what our position is with regards to the reform of constitutional structures in the United Kingdom at a root and branch level. That can take a number of different forms. I mean, I, I've been paying a lot of close attention to the Canadian system in recent months. I was looking at, um, I was speaking actually at an event last week in Edinburgh with the Royal Society uh, on differential immigration policies for the UK. It's quite clear that there's different pressures in different parts of the United Kingdom and that this is just another example where federal structure would help um, deal with the, the issues we face. For example, um, in 1902 in Scotland, the Register of General for Scotland was predicting that the Scottish population would be 9 million by 1962, so clearly that never happened. The Scottish population is only around 5 million. But there's a clear urgency in actually growing the Scottish population because we're facing a demographic time bomb where the working age population is due to decline by 25% in the next 30 years. So when we look at the UK's model of immigration, it's clearly not suited to Scottish interests at the moment, and by the same token, not suited to the interests of the northeast of England and the northwest of England either, which face similar issues demographically. So we need to have a regional variation. It's quite clear that that's something that needs to happen, but that's just another example of policy measures that could benefit from a federal structure. Um, there's also the bigger question of when we were discussing the, the Scotland Act, the SNP suddenly took the, well, they took the view that full, full fiscal autonomy would be something that would be an objective for them as a result of the exercise. And then they discovered actually that that would entail £10 billion of spending cuts in Scotland because they didn't, they didn't actually face up to the reality that pooling and sharing resources across the UK does benefit regional uh, re and redistribution to regions that don't generate the same level of um, capital expenditure particularly in areas with sparse populations. You know, there's parts of Scotland that have a, a lower population density than Mali in Western Africa. You know, so there's a huge, and then contrast it with one of those densely populated cities in London. So there's all these questions about how we deal with uh, fiscal policy, with immigration policy, is just two examples that I've set out um, there. So I, I think the Canadian model is particularly interesting around a differential immigration system where each province has a managed approach in coordination with the federal government level to manage that, um, but there's also a high degree of autonomy in places like Quebec to do that. So um, the more I look at the Canadian system, which was obviously born of the, the Westminster model of governance and the parliamentary model, um, it'd be interesting for us to learn from some of our uh, Commonwealth cousins and the centenary of the Confederation of Canada. I think we need to look abroad to, to, to learn some of these lessons and perhaps uh, our other speaker may have some thoughts on that as well. <laughs> um, I hope that helps to just outline some of the initial thoughts I have on it. Um, to take questions as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, Lindsay.
Over to you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Um, we were given a number of questions that we had to turn our mind to, and the one right at the top of the list was, does Brexit make the union more or less secure? I thought, not quite sure where I stand on that. I'm a, I have thought of playing devil's advocate and saying Brexit is great for the territorial constitution of the UK, but I decided that was too hard, so let me just say what I think. Brexit threatens to de destabilise the territorial constitution of the UK. Where will that lead? I don't know. Will it lead to some eventual accommodation that everyone's happy with? Well, possibly, but I don't think that's the most likely outcome. Um, a joint statement of the Scottish and Welsh First Ministers described the EU, EU Withdrawal Act, its provisions in Clause 11 on um, repatriated powers from the EU as a naked power grab. Um, what did they mean by that? Well, if you look at the legislation, what you will see is that in the Scottish and Welsh Act, certain matters are reserved, meaning they can be legislated on by the assemblies or parliament in the case of Scotland. Um, and these include powers that, that are within the exclusive competence of the EU. With Brexit, of course, there will be no matters within the exclusive competence of the EU. So these provisions will be struck out of devolution legislation. What does that mean? Well, in the normal course of things, if that was all it did, these powers would now be exercisable by the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly, and hopefully, in a little while, the Northern Irish Assembly. But what actually happens is that these powers will be come to Westminster. These powers will be diverted to Westminster. What are the consequences of that? Well, as you can imagine, listening to the statements of the First Ministers, there's a strong chance that Scotland or Wales, or both, will reject the EU withdrawal bill as incompatible with the interests of their areas. There is, for those of the, you, I'm sure you know this, there is something called the Sewell Convention, now in Section 2 of the Scotland Act 2016. It is a constitutional convention. It's recognised that Westminster, our Parliament in London, will not normally legislate on matters relating to Scotland or Wales. What happens if it plans to? Well, there's a procedure known as a Sewell motion where the consent is gained from, these, uh, from Scotland or Wales. And with that consent, Westminster can move ahead. Now, normally in the course of things, if a Sewell issue comes up, there's a, pro uh, a process of bargaining, negotiation, accommodation, and Parliament will move forward with something that's acceptable to the devolved areas. I don't like to call them regions, countries, the devolved countries. Um, but in this context, in the context of Brexit, is that going to happen? It seems to me there's a strong chance that Scotland or Wales or both will reject the EU withdrawal bill on that ground. It's not beyond imagination that the Conservative government will decide that they are going to move ahead, notwithstanding the objections of Scotland and Wales, if that is given. Um, the convention is such that they are perfectly within their legal power to do so, although they'd be acting out of the normal procedures recognised by the Constitution, that they can legally do that. And then what happens next? And that's, I think, the threat to the Union. Um, when Paul talked about sawing at two legs of the table, I mean, there's the two legs in action. On one, you have forces not interested in 
protecting the union, interesting, interested in using this for all the political capital they can get out of it. And you should never blame politicians for doing that. We only seem to object when it's politicians with a different agenda to ours. But, you know, just doing it is politics. On the other hand, you've got political forces um, quite determined, I think, and quite likely to be determined to move ahead with withdrawal from the EU and the EU withdrawal bill without the consent of Scotland or Wales. Okay, so that deals with that. Uh, I just want to make, add a couple of tiny little points in response to Paul's uh, uh, talk. A little historical point. I don't know if anyone remembers. I don't remember, but I looked it up. Uh, there was a Scotland Act in the 1970s. There was a referendum on devolution for Scotland. A majority of Scots voted in favour of it, but there was a 40% of the electorate criteria, and it never made it. So there was no uh, there was no devolution for Scotland from the 70s. Um, the Conservatives in the 1970s referendum, they campaigned against devolution. don't know if anyone remembers the arguments they put forward, but the arguments they put forward were actually, this is not real devolution. If you want real devolution, if you want a proper settlement, wait a couple of years, we'll be in power, and then we'll do it all over again and we'll get a proper parliament. That was their arguments about the time. And... You know, I guess if you were looking forward to that in 1979, you had a long wait. Um, so, um, the, the 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 political um, process, the political arguments, they're not always entirely sincere. They're not always entirely predictable. And if we're looking at the the stability of the union following Brexit, I mean, there's so many things to put into the mix. Like, 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 like that. That um, I think you would. I am. I am certainly not optimistic. I'm very pessimistic about the union, and I, I'm hoping that people can give me reasons to change my mind. But they haven't done so yet. Thanks so much. Well, it's fantastic to see such a fine audience uh, this early in the morning to talk about such an interesting. Topic. So let's go straight to some questions, shall we? Uh, a couple of little house rules. So if we can make them questions, i.e. ideally ending with a question mark and probably not much more than about a sentence, that would be brilliant. Um, and also if you can just give your name and organisation first as well, that would be brilliant. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Andrew Newman from um, North Tyneside constituency. I'm actually a local councillor in North Tyneside as well. Um, in, in the recent years, we've had a big debate about devolution for the North. Um, and the, the question of regional assemblies has come up again because at the moment there seems to be a patchwork of devolution for these regions with different powers, different responsibilities and it's seeming to us that the current devolution offer to the northern regions is more about devolving cuts. Now we've got a lot more in common with Scotland than we do with London and we're massively affected by decisions made by the Scottish Government especially in relation to uh, passenger duty tax and uh, New Newcastle Airport is going to suffer massively if we don't have that type of power. And I'm wondering, in your vision of federalism, is there room for strong regional assemblies with similar power to the Scottish Government? Or would the regional assemblies have power, but not as much as what a Scottish Government would have or a Welsh Government would have? It's a really interesting point. Um, I get quite impatient about all of this because I... I, I I almost want to jump to the end of the Constitutional Convention because I can always see what the what the end state would be, what good looks like in all of this. Um, and I also get frustrated because the constitutional debate is something that is grist to the mill for nationalist movements, but it's actually not the territory that the Labour Party wants to be occupying. I'm sick of arguing about the architecture of the UK and more about how we actually use the structures of the UK to deliver social justice and to deliver socialism uh, through the democratic means that we have. And I think we can better deliver that by a more rigorous and more comprehensive approach to how this architecture is formed. Um, but I'd like us just to get on with it. You know, we've been sitting talking about constitutional conventions and defining federalism in a nebulous way. I think the average guy uh, or, or, or woman in um, Newcastle or in Edinburgh or Glasgow, when you talk about federalism, I think it's quite a technocratic point. They're not really going to, it's not something that's going to set the hell on fire with them. Um, but nonetheless, it's a critical thing we need to deal with. Um, but you raise a question about 
balanced powers. I'm very much of the view that that's where we need to be. I think, I don't know whether you call it the Northumbrian Parliament or whatever, or, or, or resurrect these old ancient English heptarchies, whatever, like, to try and structure it in a sort of balanced way, um, or centre it on city regions or whatever. You know, I, I'm open to the, the discussion around that model, but I, I feel that it needs to be essentially parity with the Scottish Parliament's powers. Um, across the UK, Stormont, Cardiff, uh, London, and then whatever, however we deal with the English regions, if you like, whether it's Yorkshire, you know, um, you know, the North East, North West. Um, but also you raise an interesting point about the air passengers, for, for example. From a Labour Party perspective, that's the risk of it as well, that if we simply allow untrammeled autonomy, then you risk having a Dutch auction between different regions. That's why Labour, when it went into the Scotland Act discussions, was wary of these issues because the risk was what the SNP wanted to do was have the Celtic Tiger approach to things where it would set all the tax levels just a little bit lo lower than the UK level and then cream off all the benefits of free riding on um, that and allowing the largest to come into the Scottish economy. But where does that lead? You're going to end up with a competitive race at the bottom that ultimately diminishes working conditions and the this public realm for the UK as a whole, or the public uh, goods. So that's the risk of that as well. If you don't have certain checks and balances on the structure at a federal level as well. So that's where we have to re-examine the whole package as well. And I think that's a critical component of it. Air passenger is one example where the entire drive motivation of having that devolve was to basically, um, op, you know, basically to um, undermine another part of the UK. So that's the risk of it as well. How do we grasp that metal? From a, re from a conservative or Tory point of view, that is an attractive proposition. Um, but from a Labour Party point of view, it's not. So that's some of the risks associated with it as well. An interesting point. Yeah. Paul raises a really, a really good point just at the end of your talk, um, your answer. You talk about a, 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 race, to, a race to the bottom, the Celtic yeah. Tiger approach. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, it's easy to, you know, Scotland could use its tax varying raising power to uh, set taxes just a bit lower than the rest of the UK would presumably get an awful lot more business investment and jobs by com companies within the UK settling in Scotland. It's a great in theory until you realise that, you know, other parts of the UK could respond by doing just the same thing. And, you know, the, the, the phenomenon of a, a race to the bottom is well known. Um, I want to expand on that, though, a little bit. In the US, they call this the Delaware effect. A uh, large per percentage of US corporations are, re are registered in the state of Delaware. Why? Because company law reporting requirements in Delaware are minimal as are corporate taxes. It's a good deal if you're a US company registered in the US to choose to register in Delaware. The obvious question that, you there, that therefore arises is, well, why doesn't every U.S. corporation register in Delaware? Why does, so, why, why does Apple go to California? Um, and there is an argument. There's an, uh, there's, there's an equal or op opposite force out there. It's called the, sometimes the California effect. And the California effect is that, you know, California as a state has the, the highest standards of vehicle emissions regulations of any U.S. state. All the other U.S. states imitate California and vehicle em uh, emissions. No automobile manufacturer doesn't want to sell cars in California, so they'll all comply with California standards, whether they're manufacturing in Detroit or anywhere else. So, um, so far, so good. And this is where I, I, I think I want to take issue with something you said, Paul. And I, I feel your frustration when you said you're interested in, you're, not, you, you're interested in seeing how we can use the structures that we have for good rather than trying to, uh, rather than always seeking to argue about what structures we should have. Um, and as a matter of practical politics, that is good politics, I'm sure. But the fact is that the institutions matter. Mm. Getting the institutions right is essential to getting the policies right. That's a fair point. Um, my, um, my f I've got a friend who's an economist at Queen's University, Belfast. He's an economic historian, actually. And 
he's, he, his field, he calls it these days, this devolution economics, which, you know, is a good phrase, but really he's just doing economic history like he always did. He's looked at the history of devolution, of the economy in Ireland, including the Republic and Northern Ireland since the 1920s all the way up to the 1970s. And he says, well, economists tell us about all these benefits of devolution, um, you know, tax competition, services competition, and all the rest. But all these accounts leave out the vital fact that if the institutions aren't working the right way, you know, behavior won't follow and, you know, the, 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 the policies won't have the right effects. So I think... I think, I, I think, I mean, I'm happy for our politicians to be working on our policy. That's what, you know, they're for in a way. But um, the, the, the getting the institutions right and the economic and social and other benefits that follow from that are huge. So set in those terms, you mentioned £10 million for, for, for a properly run constitutional convention cheap, if, if you think about the benefits of getting the right mm. scheme on that, cheap at 10 times the price. Yeah. I don't want to be the fundraiser for that scheme, <laughs> but, you know, I'd happily sign the cheque once the money's there. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. It's, I'm merely impatient because I know that where we need to be, and I recognise the importance of the institutional structures, um, but I just feel that we should just get on with the, getting that developed. I just feel we've been dancing around this issue for too long. And actually, it's something that should have been sorted out in the first, uh, in the 97 Labour government. I feel that we left the, the cake half baked. You know, we solved one side of the equation, but we didn't solve the English question. And uh, my ultimate, I, I mean, to someone who comes from an engineering background, seeing something that's asymmetrical is really frustrating. I get a kind of obsessive compulsive disorder around it, you know, so I really want to see it sort of in a nice sort of a balanced format. Um, actually, I visited Washington DC for the first time just after the referendum in, in, in Scotland um, and I was struck by how the whole architecture of that federal capital um, and the way it's built actually reflects all the virtues of the idea of rebuilding the Union after the Civil War and how it, it presented and all even in the physical fabric of the city this whole idea of a virtuous union and a never more perfect union and how celebrated in that fashion. I think actually it's a wonderful uh, concept. It's probably the greatest achievement of enlightenment thinking, actually, um, the American Constitution. But I think uh, um, we need to sort of look at how we can evolve to that level of rigor. And it's not just a question of the devolved structures, it's also a question of reforming the, the governance of the Westminster Parliament, um, particularly the upper house moving to a Senate, how that would look also constitutionally protecting the role of local government in this country as well, which I think has been hollowed out in a shameful way. We have one of the most centralised forms of governance in Europe, and particularly in Scotland, it's the most centralised country in Europe in terms of its governance, and the effect of the Holyrood Parliament has been to hoover up ever more power from underneath it, um, from local government and into Holyrood, and centralising control in Edinburgh. And that's a bigger question we need to deal with as well. It's not just about treating Holyrood as some sort of shibboleth, uh, or any other equivalent parliament in the other parts of the UK. It's actually how about how about you um, constitutionally define the balance of power across the different tiers of government, and that's critical as well. It's about sub a principle of subsidiarity, um, in my view. But that's a, again, that's all stuff that needs to be addressed in this constitutional convention. I'd, and I'd hope at the end of it we'd have some sort of bible that's the Labour Party prescription for what we do with the UK. And actually, I would be of the view that we shouldn't even present it in a referendum. I would say if the Labour Party wins a majority, that's what's happening. And I'm sick of having referendums, actually, because I agree with that Lee's point about um, about them being actually the tool of demagogues and despots, and they are. They're distortive processes and they're disruptive to our democratic discourse, in my opinion. Now, it's about time we moved away from certainly binary ones. Binary ones are toxic to political discourse. I, I, I've been scarred by it, till, you know, in the last few years, growing up in Scotland. Now, it's not good anymore. Uh, I think, in the absence of clear consensus in the body politic, having a binary referendum is a disaster, um, and we can't have that again. Um, but we need to recognise in the broad consensus what um, what this prescription for the UK is and have the moral courage and the political leadership to deliver it. Because no one voted on the current system we had, so I don't see why it is incumbent on us to have a referendum on it. Um, it's my view. It was a bit authoritarian, I don't know. Great, <laughs> right, let's, let's have a couple more questions, shall we? Uh, maybe if we um, take a couple, maybe there's a um, at the back and also here. <coughs> 
Take, take both of them and then you can pick. Uh, yes, Stephen Carter, um, Birmingham in Old Southwark. Uh, I'm a, a council member of Unlocked Democracy, um, although speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that the, I think we underestimate that the Tory party actually perhaps has an interest in the breakup of the union uh, rather than simply holding on to the union in a, in a rigid way. Um, and though, although it may be subliminal, we shouldn't underestimate that. But the question I wanted to ask was actually really around the question of coherence in the constitutional settlement. And it's what do you think needs to be in that settlement in order to provide the retaining force? I mean, what actually needs to be kept at a national level? Um, my concern <coughs> is that if we swing radically from one of the most centralized systems in the world to one where there is a sort of pell-mell um, devolution of powers, that it, it may end up in a situation where it, it's not stable, where the, the, you know, the, the, the necessary national politics is not in place to ensure coherence, to ensure that there isn't massive variation between the regions um, and, and nations. <coughs> Uh, and you know, so how can we, f what structures do you think are necessary in the constitution to achieve that? Great, and let's also have a question from the front and then we can uh, address these together. Uh, John Rob Berman's in El Southwark CLP again. Um, I, 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 on, in, the lead devolution in England to me seems the problem because you've got to have people's buy-in to it. And I th see how you would, I'm interested to think how you, you would structure that because um, people don't always identify with the old government regions. I can see an identity in London, you know, we've got the mayor now. But how would you, I mean, what's your thoughts about England? Because you need to do something, we need to do something about that. Would an English parliament be a good thing? I mean, I think that would present as many problems as, as, as the current system. So I think, I, think, I think we've got a problem with England and I think we need to address that. Great, so two questions. One about stability and coherence, what should be in the settlement and what kept national level? And secondly, the problem of devolution in England, how to set about it. Lindsay. Well, let's, let's start with the second, what, an answer? Um, rather than just some reflections. <laughs> what, uh, reflections, I can do answers that take a bit more time. <laughs> let's start with the second question. Um, I don't know if people have kept up with the details of evil. English votes for English laws. Um, Paul introduced this. This came, th this was announced by David Cameron the day after the referendum. Um, the details are, once we get down to nitty gritty, what it does is it introduces, a, if, a, if a bill is certified as England only, or as the case may be, England and Wales only, it introduces an extra stage into the parliamentary process at which English or as the case may be English and Welsh MPs only vote. Um, consider what this does. It's not England legislating for England. It's not, it, it, it is an extra stage <laughs> in the proceedings in which English MPs have a veto. And David Cameron's motivations, I'm pretty he sure here, were entirely instrumental, but the, po the proposal itself doesn't, isn't entirely without principle. Um, but what was not foreseen was that the assumption was that, you know, it's, in, it's going to be in the Conservatives' interest to have an England-only stage because that means effectively Conservatives have a veto on any legislation affecting England only. Hasn't, or, or at least I don't think it will quite work out, out like that. I mean, think of the Conservative revival in Scotland. England still has a Conservative majority, but you know, you've got a situation where on any matter on which there was any level of division at all within the Conservative Party, the Conservative government would be re re relying on Scottish votes to carry the measure. Um, and the same, the same would go probably more so for a Labour government in power. And that creates this instability between, or, or possibly ungovernability sort of situation where in order to get 
past this England only stage, a measure would have to be pitched in, in one way, but in order to get the you know, the UK-wide stage, which there will still be, you'd have to pitch it another way. And, you know, that creates us a lot of hostages to fortune. So if we're talking about problems or how would that work out, I'm not looking for something that's brilliant here. I'm looking for something that's an improvement on the present situation. And I can only imagine that a, a devolved England Parliament would be an improvement on the potential problems with that situation. Um, let, let, let me say something else. Um, I lived for about f a little over five years of my life in Yorkshire, so I still read the Yorkshire Post from time to time. A few weeks ago, we had Yorkshire Day. Every mayor in Yorkshire, every local authority leader, except, I'm sad to say, Sheffield, where, which was in fact my home, every other local authority leader in, in Yorkshire signed up to, a, to Yorkshire devolution. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. We've got an area that does have some kind of regional identity. Um, what we'd have to accept, though, is that these proposals do not and should be worked forward so as that they cannot um, be a replacement for some kind of England-only parliament. They have to be worked out alongside an England only, an, an England wide solution. And I think in that way, one might get to a situation where some sort of as asymmetric devolution might nonetheless be acceptable because it would be uniform as far as England is concerned with some local authorities like Manchester, Bath, hopefully Yorkshire taking on additional powers when they think they can use them to the good of their populations. I've heard I mean, a, a lot of um, proposals around the, the question of how do you deal with England and its credit. I mean, uh, some proposals have included uh, the idea of an English Grand Committee that was based in the House of Commons, which I don't think would be satisfactory because it still muddies the waters. I think that the UK Parliament ought to be the federal parliament that is a discrete organisation, a discrete institution at the peak of the hierarchy um, of legislative bodies in the UK. Um, and I think that would present a, a much more coherent structure to, to follow everything off of. Um, in terms of whether you would have a, a singular English parliament, I don't know, based in Manchester or somewhere, um, and then have a, a subsequent tier of city regions that have high degrees of devolution, I mean, that might be a model that could work. I mean, I'm not really terribly um, sort of dogmatic about how that might look, but I don't think that it should involve any sort of... Uh, um, in, you know, what would you say? Sort of dilution of the Westminster structure. I think the Westminster structure has to be a discrete federal parliament, um, and that and that has that this, this, this clear identity as the, the, the British federal parliament. Um, and then whatever subsequent devil model works for England would, would work as a separate institution. I think that has to be key for that because it, then it opens up the question of domination of that federal parliament by one constituent part of the UK, and I think that would be problematic in the longer run. Um, and again, it op opens up the opportunity for voting reform in the UK as well through that model, um, introduction of a proportional system. Um, and again, I suppose you have the fact that if the English Parliament is then legislating for 80% you know, plus of the UK's population, in large part, then what's the most attractive body to be part of and what's left at Westminster really to, to legislate? And that draws on to the point about then what control mechanisms are there across the Union to ensure that there isn't sort of um, beggar thy neighbour um, policy making or um, frictions that would appear that might destabilise the, the, the union in the longer run. And I think one sort of model that's used currently is obviously the Barnet system of consequentials across the UK where there's a centralised fiscal control mechanism through the Treasury that's then allocated to regions on the basis of a model that's needs based, if you like. Um, and this Scotland's has a sort of proportionally higher allocation, something at the order at the moment, £1,500 per head spending bonus in Scotland, um, Northern Ireland is even higher, um, because it's determined to be um, an area with lower population density, so the cost per capita of providing a given public service is higher, um, and also because historically there was much more acute needs in terms of the repercussions from de uh, 
from deindustrialization and the, the sort of social needs of <laughs> Scotland. So these are factors that could be used through a centralised process to control allocations of fiscal distribution across the union whilst giving a degree of latitude for each component legislature to then legislate for supplementary tax variations, which I think would be beneficial. And the question <coughs> then of quibbling over what well, do you devolve VAT, do you devolve income, what share of income tax do you, do you devolve, the, devolve corporation tax, etc., etc. So that, I mean, they're, that's the minutiae that I think is not particularly helpful to get into the data necessarily, but I think you would need to maintain a controlling mechanism or a, some sort of yoke that's democratically controlled at the centre and a good example of that would be immigration policy. It would be foolish, in my view, to, de to devolve immigration policy in its entirety to one constituent part of the UK, because therefore you, you risk a bigger than neighbour approach, and how do you control it in that context? You'd need to maintain some sort of centralised control, and that's why the Canadian system is quite an attractive one, because it does have a high level of autonomy, but it's still coherent across the, across the, the Federation of Canada, because they, they coordinate it centrally. Um, so I think these are models that we can look at to, to how to, to de develop a best practice approach to it. hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's have a, a couple more and we'd like to allow some time at the end for the, both of our panellists to just sum up briefly as well. Lady at the back, please. I'll, tr I'll try and um, phrase it as a question. Would you not agree <laughs> that actually um, a lot of this is all about the emphasis on physical location? And the fact that we have still have most of our business being done in London, which is highly, you know, really inaccessible for most people, and people feel very um, remote from from London. And shouldn't we be looking at other ways of actually working that don't just rely on devolution? If we had a, for example, if we had a a, a virtual parliament that could exist in any, uh, you know, basically in anybody's home via um, you know, uh, te um, technology, wouldn't uh, we be able to solve a lot of the problems with um, you know, needing to devolve, if that makes sense? That's brilliant. That's great. And, and maybe a couple more? Uh, yeah, guy in the middle with the red tie. Hi there, I'm uh, Leo, also from Sheffield, and also disappointed about uh, Sheffield's decision on, on Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> In, in some parts of the country, we have parish council, district council, county council. We have the, the UK parliament as well. Now we're proposing to introduce city region mayors and pot potentially an English parliament and other regional parliaments. My question is, can you have too much democracy? <laughs> and, and maybe just one, one more. Yeah, go in front. Thanks. Um, obviously in Scotland we have a bit of a problem with nationalism and um, whether you would, I'm not entirely convinced that you know, uh, federalism would uh, satiate, satiate certain individuals in Scotland either elected or uh, people who voted yes, so how would you, um, uh, how would you kind of put across the argument to people who don't necessarily support the idea of the United Kingdom but um, want something different other than independence? Great. So, the, how we put it across to those who um, want something different, um, the benefits of a virtual parliament, and can you have too much democracy? Great. Uh, Paul. Cheers. <laughs> not, uh, not too much a lot to, think to about digest the there. Um, the idea of a virtual parliament is interesting. Um, I was actually, uh, my, one of my friends is actually in, um, is leading on the e-citizenship um, project in Estonia. Um, which is a fascinating model, actually, of how you'd move beyond a slightly so chauvinistic idea of citizenship and how Estonia can become like, the first e-citizenship country in the world, which I think is a really interesting idea. Um, but with regards to the actual legislature, I think it would be critical to have a physical um, institution. I think that's key to the, to the, the notion of how it exists. So I think... Um, I was laughing at, um, for years, this, the Royal High School in Edinburgh became this kind of national shibboleth of where the Scottish Parliament would be located, and Donald George deliberately didn't build it in the, that, that building because it was, it was so associated and tainted with nationalist identity. Um, so he built a new Scottish Parliament in Holyrood. Um, so sometimes these institutions become hijacked by certain political agendas, I think. But no, I think it's important you have a physical institution. But I think the great thing about the Scottish Parliament is it's a much more open institution, I think, in many ways than parliaments have been in, in the UK, uh, or the UK parliament has been in the past. So I think one of the great things about the, 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 the sort of uh, ethos of the Scottish parliament has been it's very open and very accessible to the body politic. 
um, and that's something that ought to be encouraged as part of that, particularly around committee structures and um, how you would manage the voting system as well. And that, I think, with regards to having too much democracy, you're right. The the, the structures of governance in the UK are an absolute guddle. Uh, really, they're, they're totally um, incoherent. And I think a rational approach would be to have a a balanced and and um, symmetrical, if you like, system that is reflected across every part of the UK. So that would involve peeling away all the layers of th things that have accumulated over time, you know, for various models of government, whether it's unity authorities, parish councils, you know, and we need to really just have a defined structure of how that would all work, but it has to be coherent across every part of the UK. And I think that would that would be the way to do it. Um, I don't think there's any way around that. It needs to be reflected in every part of the UK. Um, was there, something, there was something else about nationalism. Uh, there, this is a question that I, I really was pondering in the referendum. I was a, very much of the view at the outset of the Scottish independence referendum that it was a strategic mistake not to have a third question uh, around Devo, what was called Devo Max or federalism. It's difficult to present a federal, or a federal question to one constituent part of the UK. It kind of needs to be agreed mutually across the whole of the UK to, in order to implement it. Um, but nonetheless, my view was that the Labour Party doomed itself in Scotland. Not, not, it wasn't really in its gift, to be fair, but the binary nature of that referendum crushed the Labour Party's scope to offer a, a positive and visionary approach to the, the future of the country. Um, because the Electoral Commission determined that it had to be a yes campaign and no campaign, and they had to present unified arguments. And it basically re led to you know, um, lowest common denominator argument about a risks-based um, argument for staying in the union rather than a visionary reason for staying in the union or a reason why a unifying purpose is there. And I think that was a strategic error um, that crept in. And I was of the view that many of the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party were arguing for that there should have been a third question, where there was an opportunity for people who were in favour of the UK, not necessarily for a unionist, a dogmatic Tory unionist reason of nationalism, uh, just a different form of nationalism, um, but actually for a unifying purpose that was a social one. Uh, and a socialist one, or to achieve solidarity um, across a greater body politic. And that would have been an opportunity for us to have made that argument for Devo Max on that, on that basis. And I think the referendum crowded out that opportunity. But I don't think the argument's unvalid because I think the settled will of the Scottish people is actually to be in the United Kingdom. And it's to be in the United Kingdom that's reformed. I don't think there is a, a structural majority, or there ever will be a structural majority in Scotland for independence. The unfortunate thing was that the referendum gave a lot more oxygen, a lot more valency for the nationalist camp to build support because they said the UK is beyond repair, it's a shambles, it's a dysfunctional union, it's dominated by Toryism, let's get out of it, let's cut our losses and get out. You know, and that's why they're able to shut down so much of the opportunity argument that we could have been making. So we have not, we cannot ever go back to making that strategic uh, error again. Um, and we have to make sure that we dominate the argument on the basis of, of ground that's favourable to the Labour Party. Um, you know, it couldn't have been a, a more perfect storm for the SNP in 2014, and they still screwed it up. <laughs> so, so uh, I think we had, can't, we had to learn the lessons of that mistake in, the, in 2014, I think, how that was conducted. It, was, it imperiled the UK in a totally reckless way. Um, and it's another symptom of how David Cameron, in my view, will go down as the worst Prime Minister in British history, because he's put the UK at risk in a manner that no other Prime Minister really has, uh, through such sheer ignorance and recklessness and a sort of metropolitan aloofness from the whole thing that was really going on in Scotland at that time. And the only, people only really came to the understanding of what the pressures were in Scotland at the very late in the day. And I think um, that's something we need to take nicence of going forward. Right. Great. Sorry, that was a bit no, no, sure. So, Lizzie, uh, can we have too much democracy? That's why I think yeah. the middle question. I think that it's easy to talk about democracy as if it was, you know, something we can have more or or less of. And yeah, we can talk about it that way. But I think it's more helpful to reflect on what kind of democracy. Um and think about the way our democracy works at different levels and how it could be made to work better. Um the UK, and thinking primarily about the Westminster level, is sometimes characterised as a majoritarian democracy. It's the, it's the sort of democracy where if 51% wants one thing and 49% want the other, then 
the 51% get all of what they want and the 49% get nothing of what they want. Consider the recent example, Brexit. We've just had an election, did anyone notice? Um, I don't think the Prime Minister noticed. She had one approach towards Brexit before the election and then the people had their say and it, showed out, it turned out to be a whole lot more complicated than people were realising. And the Prime Minister, she retains in office and her policies are pretty much the same as what they were. You know, what a, ignoring a few details, they're pretty much the same as what they were before the election. That's a majoritarian democracy, and it primarily exists at national UK level, but when you have democracy practiced in that way, it's almost a recipe for when you get have to have coordination between the different levels of democracy. It's kind of a, a recipe for conflict. It's a recipe for... Holyrood or Cardiff or, for that matter, Manchester or London to try and oppose policies at the national level rather than to kind of coordinate and figure out what is happening at the different levels. A more consensus-oriented approach, and I mean that in institutional terms, not in terms of just being nice to one another, a consensus, a more consensus approach at the national level might make the different levels a bit more harmonious in the way they... Um, operate. That would require a number of things that might not be popular in this room, like a different electoral system, um, a different way of selecting ministers from the majority benches, but you know, it would have beneficial effects. There's, there's one problem about calling David Cameron the worst prime minister in British history, and that's that you never know what's about to happen just <laughs> round the corner. Maybe they're premature. Sorry. <laughs> you know, maybe, yes, exactly. Um, I do fear what's going to happen when we have a, you know, different levels saying different things over what we need in terms of a settlement on Brexit. And think about the Northern Ireland situation especially. And you have, and, and, and I'm not really b blaming the individual here so much as the institutions that gives a prime minister effective... Uh, control over all policies that come across her desk. I do fear for the consequences of that in terms of not just the union, but the, the, the whole of the United Kingdom. Brilliant. Um, I'd like to offer our two panellists uh, two minutes to sum up with any final thoughts, responses, rebuttals. Paul. Yep. Well, I think this question has never been more critical for the future of the UK, um, and the burning platform is clearly there, as outlined earlier on. The urgency for this is, is key. Brexit, the first question I asked the Prime Minister when I went into Parliament, stood up and said, um, there's been much play made of the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament, but what consideration has been given to undertaking a constitutional convention to actually look at how the whole distribution of, and structure of governance in the UK is dealt with post-Brexit? or as part of the Brexit process. And the Prime Minister's answer was, uh, I think in order to have a, uh, a coherent United Kingdom, we must have a strong United Kingdom that must exist as a United Kingdom. And I thought, what a vacuous answer. It's quite clear that she has never given any meaningful thought to this at all. Uh, and I was, maybe she was just taken aback or taken unawares by my question. But I just thought, that's a worrying, that's a worrying thought that the Prime Minister hasn't really given much consideration to how critical this is to the future of the United Kingdom. And it goes back to my original point, my opening remarks, that the Tory party, its ignorance and stupidity is the biggest risk to this country, as well as nationalism. Uh, and that's something we need to recognise. And we shouldn't shy away from saying that the Labour Party is the only force, the only unifying force in the United Kingdom at the moment, and it probably is the only unifying force in the UK. I know that because if it was a Labour government in power, uh, the prospects of nationalists developing their, their control in Scotland would be much diminished. And I actually remember on question time, just before um, Labour lost power in 2010, Alex Salmond was saying, uh, someone challenged Alex Salmond in Edinburgh saying, you can't wait for a Conservative government because it's absolute grist in the middle of what you want to achieve. It's, it's, it's exactly what you want, oppositionist politics in the UK. Uh, and he was smirking away, thinking, you know, and he was quite clear that's what he wanted. You know, you couldn't have got a better outcome you know, in the last few years and what's happened in the UK, you know, and that's, that's exa exactly why the Labour Party's duty now is to save the United Kingdom by developing a coherent policy on federalism. It needs to happen. 
I, I can't stress enough how urgent that is, but in the same token, we're doing it in order to set the terms for how we deliver a socialist Britain and a socially just Britain in the future. And I, I, I actually, I was in kind of maybe in violent agreement with the point about we need the structures to be optimised in order to deliver it best in a way that's coherent. And that's why we need to get this, we need to get a grip of this once and for all, structure it in a way that means, is meaningful and coherent, reset the United Kingdom for the new century ahead, and, uh, and make sure that we're ready to rise to that challenge. And that's where, where I think we need to get a grip of it. And we need to move it forward with pace and vigour and ambition for our country. And that's what I'm hoping to do as, a, as an MP in the, the coming months and years. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Lindsay. A final note, and I would like to make it, this should be a general point, but I'd rather like to defy convention and make a, a more specific pro point. And that's about the obvious uh, uh, fatigue of referenda in this country. And I'd like to conclude by, you know, just compare the two referenda. Compare the Scotland referendum with the EU referendum. They were, to my mind, quite different beasts. Um, they were different, you know, I think the Scottish referendum was, was conducted with a degree of responsibility, I know Paul will agree with this, a degree of responsibility on all sides, relatively. Um, there was a relative parity of information, resources between both sides, and there was a well thought through plan for what would happen either on a yes note or a, vo a no vote, had the result been yes, what would have happened is it would have launched a process of negotiation between the Edinburgh and London governments. After a process of months or a little bit over a year, there would have been a further referendum. And then we would have got to decide whether Scots liked what was on offer, uh, during, during which interim period all sides could be marshalling their arguments and um, considering the, the merits. What we had in, and this is why, you know, maybe the worst Prime Minister in British history comment is well justified. Think, think of the European Union Referendum Act 2015. First of all, it didn't even say that if there was a yes, a leave result, then the government could engage Article 50 to leave the European Union. We had to, we fought a Supreme Court battle over that one in Miller judgment. Totally unnecessary, of course. Parliament could have either sol solved it in the 2015 Act itself, or any time after the referendum, it could have introduced ref uh, legislation giving it that power. It wouldn't have been particularly controversial. No thought to whether, in the, there was no thought in the 2015 Act to what would happen if um, there was a leave vote in terms of should there be another vote at the end of it like there would have been in Scotland. These things were just unplanned. Um, now, I appreciate referendum fatigue, particularly after the EU referendum. But I think I'd leave you with your thought, but you know, there can be a big difference between the way referenda work when they're run well and responsibly and when they're not. Um, countries with a good experience of referenda like Switzerland use them as a process of ongoing dialogue between government and citizens with neither really having the upper hand, with each side taking part in an ongoing reflection on policy. Um, that clearly is not what has been happening, particularly in the 2015 Act. And, that, and that's, that's a shame, because that you know, discredits something that could be pretty useful. Fantastic. Well, from old English heptarchies to virtual parliaments, I think we've addressed this uh, pretty comprehensively. So thank you very much to our panellists. Thank you to Lindsay Sturton. Thank you to Paul Sweeney. Thank you to all of you for coming for your interesting and insightful questions. Do check out the rest of the Policy Exchange Programme events here at the Labour Party Conference, still a few more exciting events to go. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.